give us the lay of the land where we stand when it comes to AI technology. How much further will we go and how disruptive will it be? Well, I think the real gap that we have to bridge is productivity technology. We've been having lots of interesting consumer facing uh, things. We recently saw the advances uh, that Alphabet's made in um, their uh, Google Assistant. And uh, there's lots of fun uh, uh, gadgets that we're all playing with. But in terms of really this projection of real job displacement, real changes to the workforce, self-driving, we, we, we haven't really seen on the productivity side, on delivering um, uh, improvements in the workplace, we haven't seen a lot of progress there. So I think that that's really the bridge that um, uh, has to be uh, uh, reached if we're going to make a difference. So with the White House saying they're going to be hands off when it comes to yeah. regulation, is that a good thing and, and what does it mean? Well, I don't think that that's necessarily uh, going to actually make the economy more productive. The reason is, if you think about these new regulations they've brought in in Europe, the general data protection regulations, those, I think, are potentially going to be very important to creating a market in consumer data, which might potentially actually improve the productivity of this economy by giving people more rewards for creating better data for the economy. So you mentioned the Google Assistant, and Mark, you were just at Google I.O. where this was debuted. We actually have a sound bite of the Assistant um, speaking with a restaurant. Take a listen. See how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Um, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Now, there were some folks out there who called that horrifying, but it is also an amazing example of how far voice technology has come. It, it's an amazing example. It's just an example. I mean, to be clear, they don't have the product out in the live. They weren't demoing it uh, this week, so people couldn't actually see it or test it in use. I, I think Google was a little bit caught flat-footed about the response. Um, you know, they came out actually yesterday and said, we're going to, we're likely going to, when we when we unroll this product, we're going to identify that it's Google Assistant calling. And so a person on the other end doesn't know that they're talking, will know they're talking to a robot and not a person. Glenn, does that example horrify you or just pique your interest? I, I think it's interesting, but I think it's uh, strategically chosen, of course, to be uh, exactly something that the system happens to be capable of doing. And uh, just emulating a voice well is a very, very, very far distance from being able to do, for example, uh, secretarial work or scheduling or the sorts of things that are actually going to start changing the shape of the economy. And that's the sort of productivity uh, uh, advancements that I think would really make a difference. So, Mark, when it comes to AI and the big tech giants, you know, who's in the lead? Everyone seems to be you know, vying for this territory, some farther than others. Of course, Amazon Alexa um, you know, has also caught, captured the fascination right. Right. Um, of the world. Um, but you know, as Glenn has said, it's not just about these voice assistants. It is so much more. Yeah, I guess it depends on how you define lead, right? I mean, certainly you could you could argue that uh, research capabilities, Google and Alphabet, um, is widely considered a leader. Microsoft is too. Uh, Amazon is sort of lagging behind. Yet at the same time, they were first to market with Alexa, and Alexa is almost a verb now, right? You. you people think about, I'm just going to ask my Alexa for something, even though they, they're voice, competing voice assistants from Google um, and Apple. And so that, that's one way to measure it. I think the, you know, where we're, we haven't seen a lot of clarity that the White House came and said, we're not going to regulate AI. You know, some people will say it's impossible to regulate AI because AI is just math. Right? But, but where that, um, when the machine learning's tools affect, say, like truckers in the state of the employment in truckers or move more into sectors like banking and finance, that's where we might see some regulation, some of the consequences of, of machine learning and not just kind of broadly about the, the technology. Glenn, Elon Musk has warned about an apocalyptic future of AI. Could it be ap apocalyptic if we get there? I, I don't think that's what we should be focused on at this moment. I think that there's so many regulatory issues before we get there. And I don't think we can think about any of this without thinking about the China side of the story. The direction that they're going in this and the potential footprint that they're going to have in this space, I think, is really impactful. And Is it a threat? Well, I, I wouldn't view it as much from the national security perspective yet. I would view it more from the whole way that they're treating the data economy and the threats that that might potentially have to the way we feel about data in, in, in the US and Europe. 
So I, that, that's what I'd be focused on at the moment. What is the bottom line when it comes to jobs? Is AI going to create more jobs? Is it going to destroy jobs? You know, how do we robot proof our children to make sure that they have jobs to do when they grow up? Well, I actually think AI can be a huge opportunity for, for jobs. The reason is that it's our data that all these systems are trained on. So if we start compensating people for that data, if we actually make a market in user data that rewards the users, then actually that's an opportunity. It's a new chance for us to provide value. But right now we're not being paid. That data is being just taken from us by these companies. And China is a great example. It's going even more in the, that direction there. If we take it in Europe, they're taking a very different path. They're trying to move the data ownership back to the uh, people who create it. So we have to decide which way we want to go. There are so many ethical questions that arise here, Mark. What do we know about how, let's say, Google executives specifically are grappling with these ethical questions? Yeah, we don't know a lot. I mean, they, they talk a lot about sort of broad strokes, about how they're thinking about responsibility, they're thinking about ethics. Um, DeepMind is an alphabet AI lab that said when they were acquired by Google, you know, we'll only be acquired if we set up some sort of ethics advisory panel because our AI is so powerful that we need to have safeguards in place. Uh, they given very limited um, word publicly about what that looks like. You know, I think Google right now is grappling with it. Uh, they have a cloud contract with the Pentagon to use their technology with the Pentagon surveillance drones. And a lot of employees are upset about that and, and worried about the potential risk for down the line of using the companies and, and more automated machine learning uh, inside warfare.